Uh, in this recording, uh, we're going to look at some of the exciting miracles that happened in the Six-Day War in 1967 in Israel. In order to uh, understand the, the, the greatness of these miracles, we need to first look at the situation that was developing in the lead-up to the Six-Day War. In the month of May 1967, barely a month before the war broke out, there was an uh, alliance formed between Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq. There was a military pact in place under which the armies of these nations would come under the leadership of the Egyptian president, Gamal Nasser. And the specific stated goal was to destroy the nation of Israel. Egypt's president, Gamal Nasser, said publicly, our basic objective will be to destroy Israel. We will see that this links in with Psalm 83. I'll talk more about it later on. But the Egyptian president said, our basic objective is the destruction of Israel. The Syrian defense minister, Hafez Assad, the father of current Syrian president Assad, said, the Syrian army, with its finger on the trigger, is united. I believe that the time has come to begin a battle of annihilation. The Iraqi president, Aref, said that the existence of Israel is an error which must be rectified. Now, can you imagine the neighboring countries where you live making statements like that about your country? It would be intimidating and fearful, and you would be very concerned. In addition to this, the Arab armies mobilized and moved in position towards the borders of Israel. They had twice as many soldiers as the Israelis mobilized, and they had more soldiers that they could draw from if needed. The Arabs had five times more tanks, 5,000 versus 1,000 tanks that the Israelis had, and four times more aircraft. The Israelis were surrounded. Pressure was building on the borders. Psalm 83 brings a lot of parallels to the situation. Let's have a look at this psalm. It says, Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace. Do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people, consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off for being a nation, that the name of Israel be remembered no more. This Psalm 83 is a prophetic psalm pointing to a future war. And it's interesting to note that these people who have consulted together, made a confederation, against the people of Israel are described in verse 2 as God's enemies. It says, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. Their hatred for God and their, their animosity towards God is manifest in their animosity towards the nation of Israel, whom God has a plan and purpose for. Not that Israel is perfect, but God has a plan for the nation. And we see how the nations around are in Psalm 83, aligning together to come against his people. Verse 5 to 8, they have consulted together with one consent and form a cons confederacy against you, against God, the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gebel, Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with inhabitants of Tyre. Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. It's interesting to note that this is an unusual situation where the surrounding neighbors who often hate each other and have their own wars, are joining together to fight against Israel. Now let's have a look at the map and see where these places are located. This is a map of Psalm 83, and you can see that the nations mentioned in the psalm surround the nation of Israel. And so in many ways it's similar to the war in uh, 1967, with the only difference being that Egypt plays a major role in the 1967 war, and Egypt was not featured in the Psalm 83, unless it's mentioned somehow by another name, but it, it's not mentioned by name, which is very unusual. Now, Exodus 15 tells us that the Lord is a man of war, that the Lord is his name. God is revealed by many names throughout Scripture, and we as Christians might know him as our shepherd, as our comforter, as our carer, as our provider. And these all relate to different aspects of his character. But one name that was revealed in a time of war was this name, the Lord being a man of war. This was revealed when the uh, children of Israel left Egypt and they fled through the Red Sea that God opened up for them and the armies of Egypt came chasing after them. 
The scriptures then tell us that God looked down from heaven and he began to take the wheels of the chariots. And as the chariots got stuck, the Egyptians said, God, the God of Israel is fighting against us. And then the waters came back down, crashing down from the Red Sea and destroyed the armies of Egypt. And uh, Moses said, the Lord is a man of war. In response to this, it was revealed that God is a man of war. He fights for his people in time of need. And we see this happen again in the Six Day War. The Lord, as a man of war, was revealed through the nation of Israel. So Israel was under tremendous pressure as the Arab armies were gathering on her borders. We see here a, cartoo a cartoon which um, has the Arab armies rushing across the land of Israel and throwing the Jews into the sea. Three weeks passed with the Arab armies on the borders of Israel and they were getting more and more prepared for war. The Israelis were understandably concerned and they looked to the US to help. But the American president was stuck in the war in Vietnam and although he said, yes, we've got your back, we'll support you, they refused to give any weapons of any sort to Israel. When the Israeli Prime Minister made a statement saying that America would send their 6th Navy fleet to her defence, the US State Department quickly came out and rebuffed the statement, saying basically that they will remain neutral. With the pressure building, the key people that Israel looked for help, the key nations, were no longer there. They were not helping. You know, you and I will face times of pressure. Who do you look to in times of pressure? I have found that when I look to a person or a particular organization to help me, more often than not, in that very moment when I need them, they will fail. There is only one who never fails, and that is God Almighty himself. And so God allows a situation where his people are not able to get the help they need from others in order that they might look up. So Israel was under pressure. They were expecting 20,000 casualties or more. They were talking of a second holocaust. They had staff from the funeral agencies preparing public parks for mass burial plots. All the parks in Jerusalem were designated for mass burial grounds. One young Israeli official saw what was happening. He saw the, the funeral parlor workers preparing the, the, the public parks for mass burial lots. And he was terrified. When he came home that day, people asked him, what's wrong with you? Have you seen a ghost? Because he was all pale. You see, there was a tangible sense of fear in Israel. And in the midst of this, the Israeli leadership was hesitating and cracking under pressure. Here we see a picture of uh, Israeli Prime Minister Levi Eshkol, who was not known as a charismatic leader of any sort. He was known as one who would hedge his bet. He would have a bit of this and a bit of that. He would compromise. A popular joke at the time related that Eshkol was asked one day if he wanted tea or coffee. And his response? I want 50-50. Now, it's good to have leaders who can compromise, but in a time of war, you need to have a decisive leader. And Eshkol did not seem to be the man. He knew the nation was getting increasingly concerned, and he was looking to other nations to help, and this was why there was a delay. But with not much help coming, he got on the, the radio, made a live radio broadcast to calm the nation. But in the live radio broadcast, he stuttered, he stammered, he faltered, he couldn't find the words. And instead of calming the nation, it just gave a deeper sense of panic and hysteria, as even the, the key Prime Minister of Israel did not know, what, didn't seem to know what to do in this time of pressure. At the same time, the Chief of Staff for the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, had a, a mental breakdown. He began to hear noises. He was under, under pressure, tremendous pressure, because of the situation. And he began to hear noises, hear bombs, hear machine gun fire, when nothing was happening. We need to pray for wise leaders in situations like this. We need to pray that um, there will be the right people in place to face 
the, the wars that come our way, that as our nations face pressure, that we have the right kind of government in place. The Israeli government was not prepared. They didn't know how to handle it. But there was an outcry from the people, and they called out in the streets, they want to change. And so there was a leadership change. The secular general Moshe Dayan was appointed defense minister. With him came Baal believing Menachem Begin, and the two of them took charge of the government. Within four days, the war started. Not much time for a new defense minister to get things ready. But this was a man who knew what to do and was appointed for the time. Going back to Psalm 83, the prayer of the psalmist when Israel, when he saw Israel prophetically being surrounded by the nations, is to, that the Lord will deal with them as with Midian, as with Sisera, as with Javan at the brook Kishon. He prayed that God will deal with the enemies like Gideon defeated the Midianites. He's referring back to the time when Gideon, with his small band of 300 men, defeated the mighty armies of Midian. And he's saying that now, too, when Israel is outnumbered and surrounded, God be glorified in the small army and rout the large enemy armies. So the Psalm 83 prayer, deal with them as with Midian. Now, Egypt began to make some serious mistakes. They changed commanders across the Sinai Desert two weeks before the war broke out. They appointed new leaders who did not know the area and did not know the troops. According to Michael Oren in his wonderful book, The Six Days of War, the Egyptian commanders were people who were appointed not because they were skillful, but because they were incompetent. Why would Egypt ap appoint incompetent leaders? Well, the higher-up leaders were concerned that if they appointed ambitious, talented young people, they might begin to, to revolt and, and take over their positions. So they deliberately appointed people who didn't have the skills, didn't have the charisma to become commanders. Now, in addition to uh, these, these incompetent commanders being in place, the night before the war, the Egyptian military brass had a party for all military leaders far away from the battle lines. This meant that on the morning when Israel attacked, not one senior commander was at his post when Israel attacked. Israel's Gideon-style attack. 7.45 a.m. Israel sent 184 planes to attack Egypt, leaving only 12 planes behind to defend the nation. It was a, an all-or-nothing attempt to destroy the Egyptian air force before all-out war broke out. The Israeli planes flew only 30 meters above ground in order to avoid radar. However, the Jordanian army picked up the planes on their radar and sent an urgent warning message to Egypt. The message was encoded, as one always does. But the problem was that in Egypt they... They had changed the decoder, and they, the man in charge to, who received the emergency warning had the wrong decoding code, and so he could not read the warning that came from Jordan. So the defences of Egypt were not uh, prepared, the planes were not sent up in the air to fight the Israeli jets as they came. In addition, Egypt had turned off its air defence system that very morning. The Egyptian general Amir was, was flying in the air that morning from one location to another, and he was concerned that some of the underlings, some of the lower staff, might decide to revolt and might shoot him down as he was in the air. So the strict orders were sent out to all the, the anti-aircraft batteries not to fire uh, and not to be operational. But this happened just at a time when the Israeli planes came. So the Israeli jets were able to fly in and destroy the Egyptian runways with new weapons that had been specially developed. And then they took out the planes one by one on the ground. They disabled 18 Egyptian airfields. Jordan and Syria counterattacked, and by noon, only four hours after the war had begun, Israel had destroyed 450 Egyptian, Syrian and Jordanian planes. Israel lost 19 planes in the fighting, but this is still a remarkable outcome. And it changed the course of the war. 
Now, lies and more lies. Radio Cairo broadcast ongoing reports of great Egyptian victories in Arabic and in Hebrew. Victory parades were held in Egypt. Now, at the same time, the Israeli media were not allowed to report on what was happening, so the only reports available to the Jews were those of Arab victories. It would have sounded terrifying to them to hear the reports that the Egyptians were now getting closer to Israel, they were now going to bomb certain parts of Israel. It would have been terrifying, but it was not true. You know, for you and I, we will face times of war, times of battle. It's important that we trust in God in those times and do not listen to the reports of the enemy. They are lies. They are fabrications. We need to listen to what God tells us in the situation. Now, Israel had begged Jordan, please stay out of the war. However, Egyptian President Nasser told, told Jordan's king that we have inflicted staggering damage on Israel. And because of this, the Jordanian troops attacked Israeli troops around Jerusalem and in the resulting counterattack, Israel conquered Jerusalem. Psalm 83, at the end of it, uh, has a prayer that God will fill their faces with shame in order that they might seek your name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them be put to shame and perish, that they might know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the Most High over all the earth. The prayer of the psalmist was not just that Israel would be protected, not just that they would win the war, but that there would be a shameful episode to the surrounding nations in order that God's name would be lifted high, honoured and glorified. And this is what happened in the Six Day War. It was bad enough for the Arabs to lose, but they, having boasted so much, having proclaimed that they were winning, and then having to swallow their lies and admit defeat, made the whole experience even worse. But God's name was glorified in this situation. In six days, the Jewish people defended themselves, destroyed their enemies, tripled their land, recaptured control of Jerusalem for the first time in 2,000 years, and on the seventh day, they rested. And here's a map of the, the difference in territory. Now Israel has given back large portions of this territory in exchange for peace, but it is amazing to see what happened in just six days. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 137, If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Jerusalem is special. There is no other place like it. The Jewish people have always prayed towards Jerusalem. They have prayed that God restore Restore them back to the ancient capital, restore them back to Jerusalem and back to his presence. For 2,000 years there's been a prayer saying next year in Jerusalem. And here in 1967 this 2,000 year old prayer began to be fulfilled. And so as they conquered Jerusalem, rugged, war-weary war Israeli soldiers came to the ruins of the temple came to the western wall, the, the last remaining part of the, the temple from the times of Herod. And these men who had been through battle, been through war, these tough, gritty soldiers began to weep, began to cry. It was an emotional experience for them. Even those who, who had no idea about God were touched and began to pray. Many asked. Many had never prayed any prayers before in their life, and they asked their fellow soldiers, how should we pray? How do I pray? They were touched. They were moved. There was a sense of God's presence, a sense of prophetic destiny, even though they didn't know the Scriptures, didn't know the God of the Bible. They knew there was something special about this place and this moment. Even the secular Israeli generals began to honor God. Moshe Dayan and Yitzhak Rabin, who were both secular military leaders, they were weeping as they read the Psalms together at the Western Wall. And Moshe Dayan, he, he wrote a prayer on a piece of paper, as one does, and folds it, and put it in the crack in the crack in the Western Wall. And the Israeli journalist, being typical journalist, quickly followed after him and pulled his prayer out of the crack in the wall. And what he wrote was a quote from Psalm 118, verse 23. 
This was the Lord's doing. It is marvellous in our eyes. This man who was very secular, he saw God's hand in this war. Even secular newspapers were glorifying God with their reports. A German journalist summarised, saying, Nothing like this has happened in history. A force including a thousand tanks, the Egyptian force, he's saying, hundreds, hundreds of artillery cannons, many rockets and fighter jets, and a hundred thousand soldiers armed from head to toe, was destroyed in two days, in an area covering hundreds of kilometres, filled with reinforced outposts and installations, that is the Sinai. No military logic or natural cause can explain this monumental occurrence. Even an Israeli journalist who was a renowned secular journalist, journalist who chronicled the war, at the end of the war he said, this is nothing but the hand of God. At the same time as all this happened, God began to move and revivals broke out. There was a Jesus People revival in America with over one million people saved and it began in this year, 1967. It also marks the, the, the modern day rebirth of the Messianic Church of Jewish people coming to believe in Jesus as the Messiah again. It also marked, in 1967, the beginning of the charismatic renewal where the Holy Spirit was poured out among millions of Anglicans, Catholics and mainline denominations. All this was happening in 1967, which could well have been a year of Jubilee. At the same time, all this was only a foretaste of what will happen one day in the future in a similar scenario. You know, what can we learn from Israel's wars? There is a battle. There is an enemy who wants to kill you. We as Christians, we need to be ready to fight. Fight spiritually. We need to be aware that there is one out there, the devil who wants to destroy, kill and destroy in our lives. We have to be willing to fight. We have to wear the armor. Watch out for fake news. The enemy will come with false reports to try to intimidate you. Stay close to God. Stay close to His purpose in these times and pray that God's name will be glorified in your life. There is coming a time when the, the, the Six-Day War will pale into insignificance for what is lying ahead. Just as God's name was glorified in this short war with such a dramatic outcome, so there is coming a greater war. Joel chapter 3 tells us about this. It says that in those days and at that time, when I, God, bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, who they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. Take note here that it is, it is describing a time when the Jewish people are back in Judah and Jerusalem. And this is a time when God himself will cause the nations all the nations, to come down against the nation of Israel. It will make the, the Six-Day War look like nothing. The Six-Day War was a desperate time for Israel. Israel was in, in dire need of help. But there's coming a war where even more nations will gather together against the tiny nation of Israel, and it will look like it's at its darkest. It will look like it's at the end of the nation. And just as the people of Israel called out for new leadership at the, just before the Six-Day War, and a man was appointed who had the skill and the wisdom at the time, Moshe Dayan, so there is coming a time when Israel will be in desperate need, and they will call out for one to save them. And I believe that will be the Messiah of Israel, Jesus himself. So the nations will come against Jerusalem again. And we read then in Zechariah 14 that God, the man of war, will intervene. It says in verse 3 that the Lord will go forth and he will fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. We are not used to thinking of God as fighting. We're thinking of God as, as nice and compassionate and loving, and he is. But he is also a man of war, and here we see him intervening on behalf of his people. And it says that in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. This is a picture, and we, we, we hear the reference to it in, in Acts when Jesus left on the Mount of Olives, and it was foretold by the angels, he will return again the same way he left, and his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. At this time of great trouble, of great trial for Israel, he will come and he will fight for his people. 
You know, God is in control, he's in charge. As we hear of this story of the war of Israel, I'd encourage you not to be afraid. Not to be afraid when you hear of wars and rumors of wars. Not to be afraid when when you, we see mo armies mobilizing in the news, when we hear of nuclear tests and missiles. God is greater than the armies that are out there. He is our defense and our shield as we trust in him. Make sure that you remain close to God in these difficult times and you will see his deliverance on your behalf. Also know that any challenges you face, any, anything that causes fear in your life, there is no need for you to be afraid any longer because God is with you. He'll bring you through to the other side. One of the main names of God in the scripture is the Lord of hosts. That name literally means the Lord of armies. In other words, he is in charge. When the armies move around, when things happen on the world stage, God is in charge. So put your trust in him and he will deliver you. He will be with you in trouble. And let's look forward to together and pray for the day when he will come back to Jerusalem.